Hey everyone, and welcome to the Student Physical Therapist HIP course. It, as you may have seen before, we've kind of offered some uh, in-depth courses on the cervical spine and lumbar spine. And so we're, we're kind of working our way through different regions. Uh, I think Jim's got the knee course coming out pretty soon, and Brian's got a, a sports course as well. But uh, today we're going to be talking primarily about the hip. In this lecture here, uh, we're going to focus primarily on some of the anatomy and biomechanical aspects, but uh, we're not going to go into as much depth as you might have gone in PT school uh, previously. This is more going to be about some of the principles that are going to apply to what we're going to go through with some of the other lectures in this program. Uh, as a, a reminder, each one of these sections in the course uh, entails uh, some bonus videos, some complimentary videos, and, and some uh, articles as well, all of which kind of uh, revolve around the topic for that specific lecture. So this being the anatomy and biomechanics course or lecture, I've got a couple of videos linked below this one that go into a little more detail on certain topics uh, when we get to the examination and, and treatment uh, lectures. Then there's a lot of videos on specific techniques such as the manipulation, mobilization, exercise prescription, all that. Um, so make sure that you're paying attention for where there is, the text is read. That tells you that there is a corresponding video as well. Uh, but don't forget to check out some of the articles because they really can complement what we're talking about in the course. So you can see right there, the very first uh, one is anatomy. So there's a, an anatomy video below, which goes into more detail than what I'm talking about. It has some good animations, but I wanna go over some of the just general concepts here. So the hip is a synovial and spheroidal joint. Now the importance of the spheroidal joint is that uh, it means that it is a joint that has three directions of movement. So as we know, the hip can move through flexion, extension, internal rotation, external rotation, but also abduction, adduction. Uh, more traditionally, I think people will refer to it as a ball and socket joint, but the technical term is a spheroidal joint. Uh, the femur is the spherical structure or the ball in the ball and socket analogy. And it faces anterior, superior, and medially. Uh, so you can see here on the side how it's facing superior and medially. Um, this picture doesn't give too much perspective, but this one right here does, how it kind of uh, sticks out a little bit anteriorly. And then the acetabulum here faces inferior, laterally, and slightly anteriorly as well. It is made up of the ilium, ischium, and the pubis to form the anonymate. So the big thing uh, to take up out of this as far as the joint positioning goes and the alignment of the acetabulum and femur, femoral head is they both point slightly anteriorly, which means that there is some relative instability on the anterior aspect of the femoral acetabular joint. Now, that's just speaking specifically about the joint structure. Uh, thankfully, there's a, a ligament that we'll get to in a little bit that provides a significant amount of stability anteriorly along the hip. Um, but overall, the hip itself uh, is far more stable than uh, the ball and socket that is the glenohumeral joint. Uh, part of it comes from the compression uh, that's associated with the body weight from above and that coverage that comes from um, there applied from the superiorly directed force of the femur. Now the acetabular fossa, um, it contains and transmits the ligamentum teres, uh, and it also contains a fat pad, which is good for some of the nutrition as there are some blood vessels there and uh, some nerves as well, some very sensitive neurovascular structures. Now the, both the femoral head and the acetabulum are covered with an articular cartilage. Uh, what's interesting about that is the most superior aspect of the femoral head tends to have the thickest amount of uh, cartilage coverage. Um, what that means is it could mean that where the stress stresses that are applied throughout our daily lives uh, are greatest, uh, that there's actually either more cartilage growth or our body's more prepared for that force throughout the day. 
either way, it's, it, I would think about it kind of similar to Wolf's Law, where that stress is applied there. So there is some sort of response to make sure that there is uh, sufficient uh, cushioning, if you will, in that area. Now, that's not to say that it lasts forever or that you can just grow over time, work it more and, and develop more cartilage, as you can see with just degenerative uh, hip disease. Um, but load is a good thing for the hip joint and, and it's prepared for that. That's the main point to take away. Now, when we get into some more of the anatomy here, uh, I think it's important to recognize that there are, while there are norms, not everyone falls into that norm of alignment. So for starters, we have the angle of inclination. And what that is here, you can see, it's the angle that develops from the rise of the long axis of the femur, and then as it changes along the neck of the femur. So the norm is about 125 degrees in adults, and you can see there's a range, but that is the general average. Uh, and in uh, infants, it's more so 150 degrees, and geriatrics is 120 degrees. So over time, as weight bearing occurs, we start to see that it moves from this higher uh, number here at higher angle and drop down to become a little uh, less acute. Now, when we're trying to just describe what those actual positions are, you can have coxa valga, which is when it's greater than that 125. So that would be in this picture, they have it described as over 135. And then coxa vera, which that here they describe as less than 120. But in reality, since if we accept 125 as the norm, above 125 is coxa valga, and below 125 is coxa vera. Now, the angle of torsion is referring to the horizontal plane between the axis through the femoral neck and the transverse axis of the femoral condyles. So what we look at is the angle between right here, which is not depicted, and then right here excuse me, it's right here, and then this horizontal line right here. So the norm is that between here and here, that eight to 15 degrees of that angle, what we call antiversion, is normal. If it's greater than 15 degrees, that would be described as excessive antiversion. So what that looked like is you'd have that same horizontal line right here, but then this angle would become even greater. Less than eight degrees would be retroversion. Even if it's three degrees of antiversion, we still refer to it as retroversion. And so that would be either where it's completely horizontal or sometimes it can get so far as being here and then the hip facing relatively posteriorly. Now, why this comes into play is that impacts the alignment that occurs with, uh, with how the foot is, is set up when it's walking, going through squats and all that. So the ideal placement of the hip is this eight to 15 degrees of antiversion here. With that said, in if that's the pa patient's norm, the foot will be pointing pretty much straight forward for this. This is where the muscles work mo uh, most ideally and where the, less, the least amount of joint stress occurs. Now, if you have a patient that has excessive antiversion, in order for them to get into that normal positioning of the hip, they naturally will internally rotate their hip, relatively speaking. So it will look like their toes are pointed inward. Now, it look you'll, you might hear these people uh, described as walking pigeon-toed, um, but that is where their hip feels most normal. It's most comfortable. Uh, most comfortable. If they're to try and wa walk what would others would deem normally with their toes pointed forward, it would force their hip into relative external rotation. So this angle would become much greater. Now there's a test for this that we'll go over uh, in the examination called Craig's test, um, but keep that in mind for now. Uh, for retroversion, since this is going to not quite have that 8 to 15 degrees of antiversion, but instead will point more laterally or medially. Um, the hip must laterally rotate in order to get into this ideal position right here. So what we see clinically is that these patients will walk more duck-footed, uh, so their legs will be more externally rotated as it appears, but that will feel more natural to them. So if they were to try and correct, it'd feel like they were getting a little too much pinching in the front because they have to excessively internally rotate their hips and they don't have much internal rotation. A patient with 
uh, that's antiverted will have excessive internal rotation and a significant loss of uh, external rotation. And then retroverted patients will have a significant loss of internal rotation, but excessive external rotation. It's important to think about these concepts just as we get to the uh, point later on where we're talking about some of the movement impairment syndromes and how this might impact the, the lumbar spine as well. Now getting to the ligaments of the body, uh, we'll start with the ligamentum teres. So you can see in this top right picture here that the ligament runs from the acetabular notch to the head of the femur. Now it does provide some neural and vascular supply, but the research is tending to think that it's more of a developmental contribution and it's not a significant amount of contribution that's going to impact normal femoral blood supply. The ligament is taut with flexion, external rotation, and adduction. Next, we have the ischiofemoral ligament, which runs from the posterior surface of the acetabular rim and then winds around to insert on the anterior femur. You can see the path of the fibers right there. It is the only posterior ligament of the hip, so it has to be pretty strong. Uh, the acetabulum, due to its anteriorly directed uh, positioning, does provide some posterior stability, but when it comes to um, the non-bony stability contributions, this ligament is the sole contributor. This ligament is also taut with excessive extension and internal rotation. If you see, we're looking at the, this bottom right picture here from a posterior perspective. Um, with the alignment of these fibers, if you were to extend the hip, it would just tighten all of these. Same thing with internal rotation. So that's how you can kind of remember what um, motions it contributes to stability. Here, we're going to take a look at the iliofemoral ligament. So this is the ligament I was telling you about how there's a lack of anterior stability in the hip. Um, this is the strongest ligament of the body. So it can make up for that lack of, of joint structure stability that comes from the joint itself. Um, interestingly, it can play a significant postural function with how, uh, how strong the ligament is. You'll often see people that are typically presenting with a, uh, uh, a, a Lord, not a lordotic posture, but um, where they're sitting in excessive hip extension and kind of a, a flatter back and hunched over with excessive thoracic kyphosis, they tend to just shut down their glutes so that they can um, rest on these Y ligaments. You'll also see it in patients that have had spinal cord injuries where their glutes are not functioning as well, same thing with their quads. They can hold themselves in hip extension and rest on these Y ligaments. So it's a very important that, they're, that they have their presence as their strength provides a lot of postural support for people. Uh, they are, you can tell based on their alignment here that they uh, resist extension. And because they have some fibers that run more laterally here, they can resist a deduction. And then these inferior fibers here can resist a deduction. It's spread out along here, along the intertrochantic trochanteric line. Now the pubofemoral ligament runs from the anterior pubic ramus to the anterior intertrochanteric fossa down beneath there. And its primary restrictions uh, come against uh, hip AB duction, you can see from its inferior line of pull, and extension since it's anterior to the line of axis as well. Now the capsule, uh, which is not depicted here, does run from the base of the femoral neck to the labrum, and it's made up of fibers in three different directions, spiraling around the femoral head, which adds to some stability of the hip joint as well. So I, I had an instructor, she described both the, the hip and shoulder uh, stability complexes as uh, being more like a wound up washcloth. So while we think that a ligament can provide restriction in a specific direction, in reality, they kind of all work together to provide some stability. And the description of that um, uh, capsule, the hip winding and spiraling around there, uh, really adds to that as we think that uh, it, the combination of everything just provides a lot more stability than even the joint allows for. So while I don't have a good picture of it, the obturator uh, artery does travel through the ligamentum teres 
as we discussed previously in this slide right here. So the operator artery does run through there. Um, but it is not essential for blood supply to the femoral head. Instead, it's the medial and lateral circumflex arteries. Uh, they are the primary source of blood for the hip. It is at risk for uh, injury during a femoral neck fracture and may present with significant intracapsular pressure. So these are patients you want to watch out for, especially if they present with any signs of a fracture or history of fracture, but also uh, possibly with that antalgic gait where they're wanting to hold their leg in a loose pack position. Uh, the obturator artery, I forgot to mention, can be a significant source of pain, um, but you know, if a patient's not responding to PT anyway, we're going to be referring them out. Uh, the hip does get a small contribution to, uh, from the superior and inferior gluteal arteries as well. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about bursas. I think they are uh, kind of overdiagnosed. Uh, there are lots of different bursa in the hip, and this is just a picture kind of showing what a bursa looks like. Uh, bursa is more so, uh, it's almost acts as like a, a cushion or a lubricant between two different surfaces to, to decrease the co uh, coefficient fric of friction. So we'll often see them between each layer of the gluteus muscles. Um, typically, we have right here trochanteric bursa. So we have between the glute max and glute med, between the glute max and greater trochanter, between glute med and greater trochanter. Uh, we have the ischial uh, uh, bursa, the ileus, iliopectineal ones. Um, the big thing to take away from these is that they have these various locations, but they're next to the muscles. So while they may become inflamed from some trauma, if it's from an overuse sort of thing, you might want to try and treat the bursa to calm it down, but primarily you're going to be addressed in the impairments that led to the actual injury. Uh, if it's the bursa that's truly at fault, um, it has to be some sort of traumatic issue or infection. So when we're getting to the muscles here, uh, we're going to just talk about some of the general concepts that you want to take away from. I am not going to go over the attachment points of all of the muscles as I, I think that's kind of uh, almost beyond this, uh, this course. What I'd recommend is if you want to get into a little more detail reviewing the attachment points of the muscles, go back to your Kendall text or go back to some of your uh, work from school. Uh, it's pretty easy information to find. To me, what's more important is knowing the, the action of the muscle and some of the other implications that are kind of almost forgotten, and then the innervation as well. So that can, plays a big role in our examination. So the iliopsoas muscle is the primary flexor of the hip, uh, meaning that at end range flexion, it is the only muscle that flexes the hip. While the rectus femoris can also assist with hip flexion, you get to that end point of hip flexion and it is unable to assist at all. What people forget, however, is that it all, does have an attachment up here to the lumbar spine. So not only can it anteriorly tilt the pelvis and flex the lumbar spine when the legs are fixed, but it also can act uh, through some compression of the lumbar spine. Now that is a good and bad thing. The good thing is it can be a very good stabilizer of the spine. So when we're looking to provide some stability to the spine, making sure that the hip flexors are, are adequ having adequate function is essential. The bad part about it is that when there's some irritability there, uh, the hip, any hip flexor action can cause more pain in the spine as well. So I, I liken that to, if we think about someone that's got a, um, uh, some acute nonspecific low back pain, and they're having a hard time getting up from the supine position, uh, doing their transfers, for example. You know, we teach the people log rolling because it minimizes lumbar motion, but it also decreases how much hip flexor activity is going on. If they're trying to just swing their legs up or pull their, themselves into flexion through their hip flexors, typically they have a whole lot more pain. So that's kind of how this muscle can act negatively as well. The hip flexor, the iliopsoas is also an essential external rotator of the hip. So something to keep that in mind when you're trying to train external rotation. Uh, it is innervated by L1 through 3. So anytime you have some uh, dysfunction in the hip flexor muscle, you want to be 
be checking some of the other muscles correlated with that same innervation to see if it's more centrally driven versus peripherally. Now the rectus femoris, uh, it flexes the hip, extends the knee. Uh, because of its attachment to the AIIS, it may anteriorly tilt the pelvis. Uh, that kind of plays a little bit more role, I guess, if you're getting into some specific SI uh, assessments and treatments. Personally, I don't use that too much. However, there are cases still where I'll do some different muscle energy techniques where that muscle comes into play. It is innervated by L2 through 4. So, so the TFL, uh, big culprit when it comes to various hip and back issues, it is responsible for hip flexion, abduction, and internal rotation. Now, because of its connection, through the IT band, <clears throat> it has a couple other roles as well. Now, through the IT band's distal connection, it can actually play a role in stabilizing the knee when the knee is extended. It also has to act as a counter force uh, to the glute, uh, glute musculature forces as well. So if you take a look at uh, anatomy text, which I don't have a picture here, unfortunately, <clears throat> but the IT band runs laterally, along the, um, the femur, but along the superior anterior aspect, the TFL attaches the IT pin, and then the posterior superior aspect, the gluteus maximus attaches to the IT band. So both those muscles have to function adequately to make sure that there's no excessive motion of the IT band occurring through repetitive microtrauma. And when you're talking about hip abduction, they play a role in kind of making sure that it's a more straight planar motion as opposed to when you see dominance of one of those muscles it tends to be that as they abduct, if the uh, TFL is, is dominant, you're going to see a little more internal rotation and flexion of the hip during hip abduction. And then the opposite applies to if the gluteus uh, maximus was more dominant. Now, if the muscle is stiff or hypertonic, it may cause abnormal mechanics in the hip or lumbar spine. Um, for example, let's go back to hip flexion as a motion. Typically, when we think of hip flexion, we think of a straight planar motion. However, should, should the TFL become dominant, you might start seeing that the hip is internally rotated each time they lift the leg into the flex position. While randomly, it's not that big an issue, over time, if it's repetitively being done, can be, cause a lot of hip pain as well. And we'll get into that when we get uh, to some of the sarum and stuff. And the uh, uh, tensor fascia lata is innervated by the superior gluteal nerve, L4 through S1. And keep that in mind as a couple other muscles are also innervated by that same nerve. The sartorius muscle is responsible for hip flexion, abduction, and external rotation may play a role in tibial internal rotation and flexion due to its distal attachment, as you can see down here. It's innervated by the femoral nerve. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind with this muscle is sometimes we see some avulsion fractures up here, and then sometimes uh, we see some pes anserine uh, sort of tendinopathy uh, sorts of pains down here as well. The gluteus maximus. So this large muscle here is responsible for hip extension and external rotation. Uh, theoretically, the superior fibers can help abduct and the inferior fibers can help adduct the hip. 80% uh, of the muscle attaches to the IT band. So here is the, um, the insertion of the muscle out here, or part of the insertion. Uh, and remember, we were talking about the TFL. There's that counter force that's happening right there. If this muscle is stiff, it can contribute to excessive lumbar flexion. Now, when that applies, uh, when someone bends over to touch their toes or maybe to try and tie their shoes or bring their knee up towards their chest, if their hip is really stiff into flexion, the motion is going to take the path of least resistance. And we'll get into this again with this arm and stuff. But if the hip is really stiff into flexion coming from the glutes, lumbar spine is going to have to move excessively and you may develop some issues there. When weak, the hip, the gluteus maximus may contribute to abnormal hip mechanics and hamstring dominance. And that can lead to a whole bunch of different movement impairment syndromes. Typically in the sway back postures and degenerative joint disease, we see these muscles as 
weak or inhibited. Uh, now, the difference between inhibited and weak is that uh, when you improve the neural input to the muscle, that you can immediately see a change in strength. A true weakness, you will not see a change in strength uh, based specifically on that. And I'm, uh, I'm going to add a, a video to the assessment portion of this specific technique uh, that I'm talking about with inhibition, as that can play a role in telling you if that is weak, I need to um, specifically try and strengthen the muscle. But if it's more inhibited, we actually want to try and address the lumbar spine to make sure that the neural input is, is improved. Now, the gluteus maximus is innervated by the uh, inferior gluteal nerve. The gluteus medius acts as a primary stabilizer of the hip. Uh, the uh, PGM fibers, posterior glute med fibers, are responsible for hip extension, abduction, and extra rotation. Typically, they are weak and lengthened. That's not always the case, but more often than not, I'd say that's how they present. The anterior glute med fibers are more responsible for, for uh, hip flexion, abduction, and internal rotation. Those same actions are performed by the gluteus minimus. So the AGM and glute min work together with the same motions. During stance phase, the posterior glute med and glute min help to stabilize the pelvis in the frontal and transverse plane. They're responsible for controlling that pelvic rotation that occurs and making sure we don't see any contralateral pelvic drop or a Trendelenburg sign. Uh, both the glute med and min are innervated by the superior gluteal nerve, L4 through S1, uh, which is the same uh, nerve that innervates the TFL. So when you see a dysfunction of all of those muscles, then you notice the superior gluteal nerve responsible. Uh, typically, it's a little more centrally driven, so you'll see a strong TFL, but glute med min will be weaker. When it comes to the piriformis, I think that's one of the more confusing muscles out there for several reasons. Um, for starters, it has different actions based on the hip positioning. So when, we, the hip, when the hip is in less than 90 degrees of hip flexion, uh, it is responsible for hip external rotation, extension, and abduction. When it's past 90 degrees of flexion, the piriformis is responsible for internal rotation and adduction. Typically, you see people wanting to stretch this muscle, but more often than not, it tends to be a lengthened muscle. Now remember, just because you've put a muscle on its lengthened part and it feels like there's a stretch does not mean that it is tight. If you put any muscle on a stretch, it will feel tight, uh, no matter how lengthened it is. So make sure you're using your landmarks to determine whether or not a muscle um, truly is tight and go back to your muscle length tests if you need to. Um, often I'll just look at some asymmetries to see if there's a uh, true deficit one side compared to another. The piriformis is innervated by the piriformis nerve, not the sciatic nerve. Um, however, uh, while many think that the piriformis is responsible for compressing or being pierced by the sciatic nerve, there's a wide variety that occurs there. So sometimes the sciatic nerve goes beneath the piriformis, sometimes it's above, sometimes it, it goes through, but there are a lot of inconsistencies there. Uh, some often forgotten muscles of the hip are the short external rotators. So this includes the obturator internus, externus, superior inferior gemelli, and the quadratus femoris. That's all these little muscles back here. These muscles are important for hip intrinsic control and pelvic stability. So when we get to talking about some of the, the rotator cuff of the hip, these muscles are essential for that. They're often found to be short and weak and can limit posterior glide, which impacts hip flexion mobility. So going over some uh, self-mobilization to improve the posterior mobility and um, hip flexion mobility will be essential. We'll cover that later in the course. Uh, finally, it's innervated by L3 through S1. Now we're going to cover the hamstrings as well simply because um, they're often a, a dominant muscle group, but also can pre present as some posterior buttock pain. M the medial portion is made up of the semi-tendinosis and semi-membranosis. It's responsible for hip extension internal rotation and knee flexion and internal rotation. Typically, they're short and stiff and contribute to excessive hip internal rotation due to their medial uh, 
alignment. The lateral portion is made up of the biceps femoris, uh, both the short and long heads. They're responsible for hip extension, external rotation, knee flexion and external rotation, and may become dominant in hip external rotation as well. So when you externally rotate your hips, sometimes if these hamstrings are more dominant, these are the muscles responsible for it, which is a problem. They are innervated by the tibial nerve of L5 to S2. The hip AD ductors are made up of a big, wide different group. Uh, we have our pectineus, which is responsible for hip flexion, AD duction, and internal rotation. Gracilis, hip AD duction, and knee flexion, and internal rotation. The adductor longus brevis, which are just hip adduction and flexion. And the adductor magnus, which is hip adduction, but the anterior fibers can flex and the posterior fibers can extend. Overall, they're innervated by the L2 through 4. As a rule, I think what I like to keep in mind with this is some, um, the majority of them are innervated by uh, the obturator nerve, but also depending on their position, they may put they may have different activity at different levels of hip flexion. So when I do my manual muscle testing for hip AD ductors, I will check for irritability uh, with the hip ad adduction force with the hip in zero degrees of flexion, 45 degrees of flexion and 90 degrees of flexion. And just because it's strong and pain-free in one position doesn't mean that it's gonna be the same for the other two positions. So make sure you check hip adduction, strength and, and irritability in all three positions there. Uh, if there's a significant weakness or significant pain recreation from one of those positions, that may indicate that there's specific tendon involvement there that needs to be addressed. Now we're going to get to some of the nerves here. The big thing that I, I want you to be aware of are the path of some of these nerves because their path kind of implicates, one, how we'll test these nerves uh, as we get to them a little bit later in the examination. But also it, keep, it makes you more aware of uh, where, based on their location, what sort of irritability may be present. Or if a patient has anterior thigh pain, we know we're going to, look at a specific nerve to address that. So the femoral nerve originates from L2 through 4 and then descends between the psoas and iliacus and passes over the superior pubic ramus of the pubic bone and under the inguinal ligament right through here into the thigh. Now there is another branch here you can see of the saphenous nerve coming down into the knee as well and even a little bit lower. But when we're speaking specifically about the femoral nerve, it's going to be coming right over here, the anterior thigh. The lateral femoral cutaneous nerve originates from L2 through 3, then runs through the pelvis anteriorly and angles downward at the ASIS, which is right here, where it passes through the inguinal ligament and finally moves towards the lateral thigh, piercing the fascia lata. So it's going to be responsible more so for the lateral uh, thigh pain, sometimes a little more anterior as well. The obturator nerve originates from L2 through 4 and is formed within the psoas, then runs through the pelvis to the obturator canal, which it then exits to enter the medial thigh. And we can see right here, it's going to be, you're able to palpate it typically um, just between some of the different muscle bellies, but it's responsible for a lot of that inner thigh pain. Um, and innervation of a lot of those hip AD ductors. And your sciatic nerve back here originates from L4 through S3 and descends through the pelvis and sacrum uh, before exiting the pelvis posteriorly above, through, or below the piriformis, as we discussed before, and then descends along the posterior thigh. This picture depicts the uh, sciatic nerve des uh, descending the piriformis below, the, uh, sorry, below the piriformis. Some general uh, rules of the hip to know the capsular pattern is loss of flexion is greater than loss of abduction, which is greater than loss of internal rotation, or sometimes internal rotation is the most limited motion in the hip. Um, I'd say that's the most typical one that I see, but in general, if you see a significant loss of motion in all directions or most directions, that it's a capsular restriction. The closed pack position of the hip is extension, abduction, and internal rotation. That is important because that is the position we do our 
SI manip in. So when you get your patient into the prone position, we extend abduct and internally rotate the hip because that almost locks out the hip. So our force is more likely to be transferred through the SI joint and lumbar spine. The open back position of the hip is 30 degrees of flexion, 30 degrees of abduction, and 20 degrees of external rotation. This is the position that we manipulate the hip and is typically done in supine. It loosens up the hip so that you can try and uh, specifically focus on affecting that joint. Uh, some general kinematic rules for the hip. Uh, here are some of the motions for uh, hip range of motion. Again, I would generally go based off of uh, asymmetries in the patient. Um, I can't overstate enough the significance of uh, what that last couple degrees feels like side to side. Um, it tells me that there's some involvement on the side. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's hip involvement. Um, it could mean that the lumbar spine is causing that stiffness in the hip, but make sure you're doing your general screening of these motions. The less hip flexion there is, the more that it's going to be transferred to the lumbar spine. Um, if there's a significant deficit in internal rotation, a significant uh, excessive amount of external rotation, the patient might be uh, retroverted. Uh, so keep in mind some of those general concepts when you're looking at the range of motion, but as a rule, look at asymmetries and uh, big jumps from some of the norms. Uh, for some of the arthrokinematics, I do have a, a video below for you guys to watch where it goes into some detail on the arthrokinematics, but it is a ball and socket joint. So there are some convex concave rules. Um, I'd say that the the big thing to take away is that when we're talking about abduction and adduction, we're going to have the more normal convex concave rules. Same thing with uh, internal rotation and external rotation. So when you're abducting, your hip is rolling almost laterally or, or superiorly and gliding inferiorly. Does that make sense? Uh, so as you move the the femur laterally the ball or the femoral head is going to try and roll laterally and then has to glide medially and inferiorly to compensate for that and then it's vice versa for a deduction when we're talking about internal rotation you're going to have anterior roll and posterior glide external rotation is the opposite so posterior roll anterior glide with flexion extension it's going to be more of a spin motion because the motion occurs around a single point of axis, there's spinning that occurs in the femoral acetabular joint. Now again, check out that video and he'll kind of depict a little bit more of what's going on in there. Uh, still not as great detail as I'd like, but it gives you an idea of how the femoral head is moving relative to the, to the acetabular. The dynamic loads across the joint are important to recognize just how much more force goes to the hip than when we think about just standard body weight. Every time that you're on a single limb, uh, a single limb, the body weight force is almost doubled, and then you get additional uh, force that's increased based on the muscle activity. So just walking the muscle forces attached to that, you get a 238% body weight force uh, through the, the femur. When we're climbing the stairs, it goes up to 251 percent and then descending the stairs is even greater simply because it's more of an eccentric force so that creates more force uh, for the joint now something that i, I want to kind of just introduce the idea here um, we'll go into this more when we get into the examination part but a lot of what's taught in your kinesiology and biomechanics courses are single planar motions. So your flexion extension, sagittal plane, your abduction, adduction, uh, the frontal plane, all that. Uh, but a lot of what we do in our daily lives are multi-planar motions. So we can't just assess and treat based simply off of the single planar motion. We have to make it more functional in that we have to consider how a joint uh, moves in one range affects how it might move in another. So when we look at this uh, soccer player here, you can see his hip is moving into quite a bit of extension. It looks like there's some pelvic rotation there. Um, there's a little bit of hip rotation as well, and probably some abduction. 
Now, do we assess those motions altogether? No. And we'll get to, I'm going to show you a method of how to assess those combined motions a little bit later. But it is highly unlikely that you'll find someone who, when you look at those norms for hip mobility, that if you take them to the end range of flexion, that they have that same norm of internal and external rotation. There's a big change just based on the tissue tension that develops, uh, but that is more functional and making sure that whatever their task is, um, they have the mobility for that is, is going to be essential. So what we'll end up doing is changing uh, the hip range of motion assessment based both on position of the hip and also the load as both of those can play a role. And what I mean by load is non-weight bearing versus weight bearing and also position of flexion extension, all that. Depending on what that patient does, significantly can play a role on how much they can move. For example, when we're talking about normal gait uh, walking, as the hip moves into extension, the pelvis is actually displaying some form of rotation in the uh, transverse plane as well. And so what, what has to happen in order for the hip to stay in what appears to be more of a sagittal motion, there has to be some form of hip internal rotation as well. So for end range extension to occur, there has to be sufficient internal rotation. Uh, keep that concept in mind, and we'll, when we get through the uh, examination portion of the course, we'll go into a lot more detail on that specifically and show you how to assess that. But we may need to stop limiting ourselves to a single planar motion assessment and think more about what sort of functional multi planar motions are, are occurring. And maybe we can't find a norm for them, but maybe what we can do is just at least look at asymmetries in the patient. So that is it for the uh, anatomy lecture today. Um, make sure you check out those other videos below and the associated uh, 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 blog articles that, that are listed below as well. as they, Some of that information can uh, really amplify what we're trying to talk about here. But uh, then we'll continue on with uh, the differential diagnosis, examination, treatment, and movement impairment syndromes lectures. Thanks.